a great privilege and honor to have the chance to introduce Admiral Ruffhead to this crowd. He has emerged as the top commander in the Navy and a member of our Joint Chiefs of Staff from a terrific, varied career. He's a graduate of the Naval Academy. And looking at his background, he seems to have served on almost any kind of ship you can imagine. He's the only man to have commanded both of the Aegis cruiser class ships. And those of us who worry about um, ballistic missiles and things like that, think of that ship as I believe the best um, anti-ballistic missile system there is. So he's an expert on that. So he has done it all. In fact, he went back to the Naval Academy as the commandant of the, of the Naval Academy. I kind of like that as a Marine. I like that word, commandant. So <laughs> somebody has that there, all right. And of course, I can remember as a Marine with the Navy. Boy, we love the Navy. And you'd get one of these operations, and you could see Navy ships for you couldn't see the end of them, there were so many. And you saw the firepower they could deliver. Uh, boy, the Marines love, go ahead, deliver it. We love it. So we love the Navy. There are other, a few other aspects of uh, Admiral Ruffhead I want to bring out. He's a bike rider. And one of the rides that he does regularly, it's a ride to recovery, I think it's called. And he rides regularly in these events that raise funds to support our men and women wounded in war. So he's right there in support of people, whether they're healthy or not healthy, if they've served, particularly they've served in combat and are wounded, he's their guy. And I think that kind of sense that we get from the top penetrates down and does wonders for um, our Marines and soldiers and sailors. He also has a dog, a new dog. And uh, <coughs> its name is Arlie Burke. <laughs> so, <laughs> man, uh, you gotta love a guy like that, huh? <laughs> and he has a tattoo, I'm told. And now I read that there are regulations in the Navy and the Marine Corps that said you have to disclose and have a photograph and so forth. And Admiral, I want you to know in my day, I had a simple Navy way of dealing with that. I had a no confirm or deny policy. <laughs> but it's a really a great treat for us to have you here, sir. And it's my great privilege and honor to introduce Admiral Rohad. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. It's uh, great to be back in San Francisco, uh, a city whose history is interwoven uh, with the history of the United States Navy. We're recently reminded that our security and economic environments are changing and they're challenging, to say the least. But in that change and in that challenge, I see growing opportunity for American sea power to contribute to national objectives in development, diplomacy, and in defense. In the President's national security strategy, he stated that a just and sustainable international order will be the indispensable factor in global prosperity and peace. It's a sentiment he reinforced in India last year and again with President Hu of China just last month. I agree with that proposition and I routinely concern myself with it as the Chief of Naval Operations because at the end of the day, the benefits that we derive from a globalized world stem from that which moves on the world's oceans, whether tangible goods, resources, or the electrons that facilitate the exchange of ideas and constitute the basic building blocks of commercial transaction in a digital age. America's influence and power must be assessed in the broad economic context. It's important to start with the economy because our prosperity is the foundation of our national security. It is also true that that prosperity derives from the health of an international system that we help create and which has survived because of U.S. leadership, 
U.S. cooperation with global partners, and America's tireless service as a global security provider. Whether it has been in preserving the freedom of the high seas for uni universal commerce or projecting power, the Navy has played a central role in America's global leadership. As we plan for the Navy of the future, we must take a realistic view of that future and ensure that a dominant fleet continues to provide the six core capabilities that we set forth in our maritime strategy. And that is to be a global Navy, to be a deterrent force, and deterrent not just in the context of our nuclear deterrence that's so uh, well represented in our ballistic missile submarines, but also to be able to exercise sea control wherever and whenever it may be required, to be able to project power wherever the nation calls upon that power to be projected. And it's not just in the form of airplanes coming off of aircraft carriers. Uh, it can be missiles uh, being launched from our ships and our submarines. But it's also in the form of a truly unique relationship of United States Marines operating from our amphibious ships. We have been pushing the fleet hard. The fleet today is at 286 ships. It is now the smallest fleet that it has been since 1916 when our global interests and our global responsibilities were nowhere near what they are today. And with that number of ships, it's very hard to meet the global demand that is placed on us. But we've also taken action with an eye to our future. We restructured ourselves. We've placed underperforming programs back on track. We've introduced affordable capacity into shipbuilding and aviation plans and advanced capabilities to meet the most likely threats. We enhanced readiness to sustain our force, and we've improved the quality of life of our sailors, our Navy civilians, and their families. Today, our Navy is represented by 327,000 active sailors, 65,000 reserve component sailors, 160 Navy civilians, and over half a million retirees. But it's that Navy that provides us the offshore options for an uncertain future when we expect sovereignty concerns to increase around the world and in that increase of that sovereignty concern to increase the reliance on American sea power. For many citizens, the benefits of a strong Navy aren't readily apparent. Although we're a maritime nation, we suffer from what I call sea blindness. And it's not a result of the nation's appropriate focus on the current wars that we are in. The Navy's involvement in the Middle East, in the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, is best represented by the sailors that we have serving there. As we are here tonight, there are over 14,000 sailors serving on the ground in Iraq and Afghanistan. Their are SEALs, their are explosive ordnance disposal, their are construction battalions, but they're just good sailors who we believe have the capabilities and the competence to fill in in those areas where the ground force does not have the capability or the capacity. Two years ago, we reorganized ourselves. I combined the Director for Intelligence and the Director for Command and Control into one organization. And everyone thought every CNO gets to do one wiring diagram, change a tour. And then I started to move the money. And then people got really interested in what we were doing. And for the first time now, we're able to look at this world of information and cyberspace through one lens and make decisions that spread across the Navy and were not fragmented in the way that we have been in the past. We reactivated the U.S. 10th Fleet. The U.S. 10th Fleet was formed by one of my predecessors in World War II when he was faced with a threat that was new, that was problematic, uh, and that no one had a solution to. And the 10th Fleet was formed and beat back the German U-boat threat in the Battle of the Atlantic. And so we reactivated that fleet to take a look and to go after this new world of cyber.
And I've had the privilege and the ability to pick up the phone of my Egyptian counterpart uh, and call him directly uh, during the course of these last couple of weeks. And I was assured and reassured uh, that that military was focused uh, on a peaceful transition and also focused on not um, engaging in violence toward their people. There's a number of questions about what are our Navy forces really doing about combating piracy, specifically Somalian pri piracy? Right. Thank you. Um, we, uh, we've kind of gone full circle. Uh, we began as a Navy because of pirates, and we're still chasing them 235 years later. Um, the uh, uh, piracy in the Somali basin is a criminal business. Uh, they are able to take the money from the ransoms. Uh, the structure that's used by the clans that are engaged in piracy is really quite sophisticated from a business standpoint uh, with the salary uh, structures that are, are played. But the money is fueling this uh, criminal business. But what has happened is that uh, piracy has brought together many nations and many navies. Uh, but the challenge that we face is that we're patrolling an area four times the size of Texas and a coastline that's equal to the distance from Maine to Florida. So it's a big piece of ocean. Uh, but what we have been able to do is pull together many countries. I refer to them as the strange bedfellows. Because if five years ago, even four years ago, if you had told me that the U.S. and NATO forces would be doing counter piracy, yes. And then EU, I would have said yes. Uh, but then we have Korea coming in. Uh, we have Japan coming in, not unexpected. Um, India, not unexpected. Then Malaysia, a little far from home. Singapore coming in, a small navy that punches far above its weight. Uh, but then Russia comes in. China comes in, and that's the coalition that's operating down there fighting piracy. But until there is rule of law in Somalia, we're going to continue to be in the same mode that we are now. You have to be able to go ashore and, 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 and impose the rule of law on the leadership uh, that, are, that are running these criminal businesses. It's not the young gunman who's jumping on the ship that's, that's the, the source of the problem. It's the machine ashore, uh, much as the, the Singaporeans and the Malaysians and the Indonesians found, that's where you have to solve the problem ashore.